thank Dr. Pettinger for inviting me for the third year in a row to come and uh, give this presentation to talk specifically about public service, my experience as a Western Oregon University student and alumnus, and uh, also just to give her a plug, she's a wonderful teacher, you're all very lucky to be in her class, and if a good grade isn't necessarily the best incentive for you, then remember this, because this is a class about engagement. When you leave this school, when you're looking for jobs, for internships, for fellowships, for opportunities, uh, Dr. Pettinger is a wonderful resource, and she's more than willing to help out students that were effective and participated in class. And so if good grades aren't good enough, then I encourage you to take full advantage of her as your teacher because she's great, and she's also a wonderful resource after you graduate. So with all of that, I will begin my presentation. And if there are any sort of technical goof-ups with, uh, with the PowerPoint, I apologize in advance. This is an outline of what we're going to be talking about so that you have a decent idea of where we're going. So the first thing that we're going to be talking about is kind of about me and about kind of the, the journey that I had both as a student here and as an alumnus, how I got from being a student here to where I am now. We're going to be talking about the importance of public service, talking about what do public servants do, what does it look like, and moving on to why there are great benefits in public service, both for the public servant, but also the public at large, and talking about uh, why this is a great thing to do with your time. We'll be moving on to how to get involved. So a lot of people uh, will be really excited to get involved, to volunteer, to enter a career in public service, but they don't know what are the first couple steps to get me from being a student graduating, going into the workplace. And so we're going to be discussing what are some steps and some advice that I have for people who are interested in getting involved. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is have, uh, I hope, a lively discussion about public service. Is this something that appeals to you? Why or why not? Having uh, the experiences that brought you to this room plus this presentation, what are kind of your thoughts and what are your ideas and what makes you feel energized talking about that or not? Lastly. Uh, this is a new appearance in this presentation, is that Dr. Pettinger asked me to talk about what are, what are some of the policies that my office is working on and kind of giving you a snapshot into the work that I do and why I do it. And so we're going to be having a short conversation about DACA. If you're not familiar with DACA, that's okay. I'm going to show you a short two-minute video that will kind of summarize the program and what it's about. And then I will talk about why, why this is a federal program, and I work in state government, what is my office doing that can help people who are DACA recipients, even though I don't work for the federal government? About me, like you, I was a Western Oregon University student. I am a first-generation college student. None of my family previously had gone to college before, and I transferred in from a community college as a junior, which um, I'm suspicious mirrors a lot of the experiences of people in this room and also people who will be watching this video in the future. And so for me, Western Oregon University was the place I chose for my undergraduate education because of the student to teacher ratio, the size of the classrooms, and coming from a rural community in Oregon, uh, growing up in a small town not too far from here, I was interested in the kind of educational experience where my teachers knew my name. Coming from a small town, I wasn't interested in joining an amphitheater with 300 other students. I really wanted an opportunity to get to know my teachers and for them to get to know me. After graduating with my bachelor's, I went on and I had a really amazing experience of backpacking through Europe. Again, first generation college student, working class background. We didn't always have a lot of uh, funding for things like an international vacation. And so for me, my first opportunity to leave the country was as an adult. I had studied abroad in Italy my junior year here at Western. If you haven't studied abroad, but you're interested, please go talk to the folks in the office and see what opportunities are available. Incredible experience. And where I am now is directly influenced by the experience that I had studying abroad as a student at Western Oregon University. And that's what led me first to this amazing backpacking trip through Europe the summer after I graduated, and ultimately what led me to apply to a graduate program at the University of Edinburgh, which is where I obtained my master's degree directly following my uh, bachelor's program here at Western. And so the experience of having studied, lived in Italy, traveled in Europe, really 
set me up to, okay, I've seen kind of snapshots of other cultures and other places and other ways of doing things. I want that immersive experience. And so not only was I able to live for 12 months in Edinburgh, which is an incredible city by all accounts in my, my humble opinion, but also I had the opportunity to study at a world-class university and kind of immerse myself in a different academic point of view, which is a more European point of view. And that was uh, an experience that really helped to spin a lot of my experiences as an American, as a rural American, as a working class American, going into an institution in a different country and learning about a completely different way of looking at the world. And it was incredible. And so anyone who's considering graduate studies, I encourage you to consider uh, what are the opportunities in other countries? Because in addition to getting a great education in a graduate program, you'll also be able to see what are some different ways of looking at the world because you're not going to be looking through the lens of an American point of view. After I graduated from the University of Edinburgh, uh, the travel bug wasn't gone yet. And I had gotten a taste of what the world was like and I wanted to know more. And so I got a position teaching English in South Korea, which led me there for a year of teaching English. I decided I did not want to be an English teacher which uh, was one of the things I learned as uh, doing the job. Sometimes the best way to learn if you want to do something is to do it and find out it wasn't quite for you. And while being an English teacher for uh, an all-boys middle school, imagine how, uh, how wonderful that was. You have a bunch of uh, hormonal middle schoolers and they don't speak English that well and you're trying to teach them. Interesting experience. Uh, I was able to travel around Asia a bit, visit some other countries. And again, going from working class rural Oregonian having studied in, at the University of Edinburgh in Scotland, moving on to rural South Korea, really different perspectives. And it really challenged a lot of the assumptions that I had about myself, assumptions that I had about Asia, about South Korea, about different cultures, the kind of collectivism versus individualism that we are kind of identify with a more Western perspective versus a more Eastern perspective. And it was just a really incredible experience, even though sometimes it wasn't always fun. And so sometimes these experiences are challenging that aren't necessarily what you thought they were going to be in uh, some ways can challenge assumptions, which are generally, I think, a good thing, and also make you learn more about yourself, your culture, just as you're learning about a different culture. And so really interesting experience and something that uh, I would encourage a lot of people to try out. It might not be for you, but you will learn a lot. And that brings me back to Oregon. I came back to Oregon in 2014. I got a job working for a local state senate election and uh, kind of immersed myself into that experience. Uh, it was down in Corvallis. Uh, we defeated an, an incumbent and the senator that I worked for is going to be running for office, uh, the same office defending her seat uh, actually this coming uh, election cycle. And so taking my experience of I studied political science, I studied government, I studied pol uh, political philosophy at Edinburgh. I, I went out into the world, I challenged some of my assumptions, I learned a lot about myself, about my culture, about other cultures, and I came back and I took a lot of those experiences and kind of just delved into uh, politics and public service at the local, uh, the local level. After we finished up in that election in 2014, I had a position with one of the Oregon State Representatives, working in his office in constituent outreach and communications, drafting press releases, speeches, um, and also being kind of a lifeline between our legislative office and the district, which is Central Coast. I went on to become the campaign manager for Representative Paul Evans, who is representative from this district, and we won his re-election campaign. And now I'm the legislative chief of staff for one of the incoming uh, legislators, which has been a very interesting experience because for me, having worked both in elections and also having worked in the building, in the Oregon legislature, with a new member, I've taken on an interesting role in that I have more experience than my boss. And so instead of being an administrator, instead of being someone who takes the vision of the representative or the candidate and makes it so, I'm actually an advisor, which is a really interesting experience of being the person who's paid to tell an elected official what they should or shouldn't do, <laughs> which has uh, so far been a lot of fun. And uh, it's, a, it's a really, really interesting way to get to know your state government is working in the building talking to the elected officials and uh, seeing how policy is made at, at uh, the local level because it's much more accessible than the federal level, partly because of just scale. Now, why is public service important? That's one way to ask this question. What I think is a more fitting question to ask 
is to look at what do public servants do? So there are public servants throughout the different sectors. What are these people doing? And while there are a lot of different things that public servants do, I broke it down into four major categories. Four categories, that's three, four. The first category, nonprofit organizations and non-governmental organizations. Organizations like Amnesty International is the example I have there, but you could talk about Heifer International, for example. You could talk about uh, more local uh, organizations like Habitat for Humanity. These are organizations that are, the way you can think about it is providing direct service. When you're in the government and providing services, there's the bureaucracy there, there are stipulations based on service, you have to have certain income, you have to have certain level of credit, things like this. Nonprofit organizations and non-governmental organizations generally provide direct service uh, without as many loopholes, or not loopholes, but uh, sort of barriers, and uh, without, uh, without as many stipulations on their services. They also provide research, um, which is really helpful. Sometimes the, uh, they provide presentations to the legislative bodies, either at the state level or at the federal level, to show what their research and the trends that are going on should due to influence policy, which is really interesting, and uh, a, really, a really interesting sector to work in. Uh, one of the downsides to nonprofit organizations and non-governmental organizations is because they're providing direct services, this is not uh, necessarily a lucrative way to go. Uh, the people who work in nonprofit organizations and non-government organizations don't tend to make uh, the most money in the public sector, but that doesn't mean that their work is any less valuable. Another place to look for opportunities for public service is in government. And I put here the seal of Oregon, and we're talking about state, local, and federal government. Uh, but also, I think, at least when I think about government, I'm thinking about, because of my own context, working the legislature, people who work for the ju judiciary branch, people who work for the executive branch. But this is the public sector. This is state, local, and federal government. So if you're working for public works, you're a public servant. If you are a teacher in a public school, you are a public servant. And uh, so when we're looking at this uh, part of public service and these opportunities, this is a vast amount of opportunities. These are pretty much anyone who's working for the public sector and whose uh, salaries are paid at least in part by tax dollars. Uh, a lot of really great opportunities here. Some of it is partisan work like my own working in the Oregon legislature, but there are a wealth of opportunities in uh, state, local, and federal government. Third. Legal advocacy. So a lot of groups, and some of these are nonprofit organizations or non-governmental organizations, will provide legal advocacy for people who cannot afford to represent themselves. And when you think about legal advocacy, I think most people think about courts and going to court, but that's only a very small part of legal advocacy. Uh, most cases do not actually go to court. They're settled out of court uh, through uh, some sort of arbitration process. And so for people who can't afford to have a uh, someone representing them uh, in a legal sense, uh, having organizations that provide that advocacy is incredibly important. And lastly, the fourth that I'm considering here are private businesses or private groups that contribute to the public good. The example I have here is Microsoft, who uh, does quite a bit of work around the world in uh, international development and in communities, but we could have just as easily put Willamette University as the icon there, a private university. There are private groups and uh, private uh, private organizations that do provide to the public good. One of the benefits is of looking at this part of public service is if you can get a position with a private entity, typically you make more money. And so for people who, uh, for, for whatever reason, cannot accept a lower salary but want to do good, want to help their community, they can, uh, they can look at some of these private organizations that are doing great things in their community and around the world. And so kind of at the, the beginning of this slide, the questions were, uh, why is public service important? and what do they do, kind of looking at that. So why is it important is this, is that oftentimes there are important things that need to be done in the community that cannot be done by an entity that is seeking profit. And that's not to cast any uh, sort of normative uh, shade on that. For organizations that are assembled for the purpose of making a profit, they have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. That's just how a corporation works. And so, for the things that need to be done, for the people who need to be helped, uh, the reason why we have public servants and public service is that uh, government 
and nonprofit organizations can provide these services and provide the support without having to worry about making a profit while doing it. So next, hopefully I've got you interested at this point in public service. So let's talk about benefits. And I've broken these into two basic categories, the intrinsic benefits of public service or working in the interest of the public good and the extrinsic benefits of uh, doing so. So does anyone know what the difference between an intrinsic benefit and an extrinsic benefit is? Bueller. In the back. Uh, intrinsic would be how you personally feel about it. So you feel good doing it and extrinsic would be like monetary or uh, social status. Perfect. So uh, to summarize the point saying that an intrinsic benefit often is um, the, the feeling, it's uh, less of a material sort of uh, experience and it's more about what you feel when you do it and an extrinsic benefit is more about what are you know dollars and cents, what are the benefits, the concrete material benefits. And so when we talk about intrinsic we're talking about in of itself. So this is a value, uh, a benefit that is in of itself. This is something that just in doing something or in just in being something has a value and an extrinsic value being a material so less of a sort of conceptual uh, benefit and more of a material benefit and the example that I'm going to give right now is education because you're all college students and I'm a college graduate so why did I go to university well you can say intrinsic, intrinsic benefits I gain skills I gain knowledge I gain connections and these kinds of uh, intrinsic values. But an extrinsic benefit, I make more money than I would have if I didn't have a degree with my name on it. And that, that's uh, a lot of the reasons why people in my generation went to college is because we were told if we did not have a college degree, we wouldn't make enough money to make ends meet. And so that's kind of one of the examples that I feel is, makes it really clear the differences between the intrinsic and the extrinsic values. So let's talk about intrinsic benefits and extrinsic benefits of public service. Intrinsic benefits. Community. When you are in a nonprofit organization, when you are working with a government entity of some kind, if you're a part of a private organization that is benefiting the public, you are in a community of people who have a shared vision. And that vision is we're going to make you know, Western Oregon University a better place to be. We're going to make Monmouth, Oregon a better place to be. We're going to serve the needs of the people who live here. We're going to protect the environment. You know, you have a sense of a community of people who have a shared value and a shared vision for that organization. Another intrinsic benefit are the skills that you gain. I talk about this with uh, education. My education provided me with significantly better, you know, analytical skills organizational skills than I would have had if I'd never had gone to college. And so as you are entering uh, the public sector doing some form of public service, uh, you, you gain a lot of skills that you might not necessarily have had. Because again, when we're talking about why is there public service, why do people become public servants, it's because there are some things that a private entity or the market can't provide. That there isn't a profit to be made there and so Corporations won't do it, or businesses won't do it, or private groups won't do it, but it needs to be done. So you'll be doing different things than a private organization. And then lastly, you can call it happiness, you can call it purpose, you can call it fulfillment. You are working in a field with an organization, with a group that is helping your community or helping a different community. There are all kinds of international organizations that are providing support all over the world. You are doing something that makes you feel fulfilled. You are doing something that makes you feel good about the work you're doing instead of working with a group where you know, the, the product that, you, that you're creating, whatever it is, um, the, the input, whatever you're accomplishing is more abstract. When you're in public service, you can see the direct line from what you are doing, your labor, and what is being accomplished. And for most people, myself included, it's, it's very satisfactory. One of the things that I do in my job is I do constituent services. And so we get calls from people who are in danger of losing their housing. We talk to people who are in danger of losing some sort of assistance or their job, and we can connect them to the services that will keep them in their home, keep their children fed, and make sure that they have a way to get to and from work, for example. And this is really important work, and the fulfillment and the happiness and the purpose that you get with that is really uh, something special. Now, extrinsic benefits. Uh, we've already talked about how typically, not always, but typically in the public sector, you make less money than the private sector. And that's uh, across the board generally true. But there are extrinsic benefits. 
And one of those extrinsic benefits was put into place by former President Bush. Uh, and it is called the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program. If you are anything like me, you're going to have loans when you graduate from college. I, I couldn't get through college without taking out loans. And so for me, knowing that there is a program in place, which is still currently in place, there was uh, some consideration of ending the program under the current administration, but that seems to be put on hold for now. If you make 120 payments, one payment a month for 10 years, while making 90% or more of your income in a public sector position, nonprofit, governmental, that sort of thing, then they will forgive the rest of your debt. And so as a way of paying you back for working towards the public good, for taking a position where you make less money, and uh, you know, pursuing that dream of public service, you can also get a very real benefit, which is uh, having a good amount of your debt, if you're me, because mine's quite a bit, uh, forgiven by the government. So we've talked about what public servants do. Let's talk about what are some ways to enter public service. So the first step I would encourage you to consider is what do you want to do? There are a wealth of organizations out there, nonprofit, non-governmental. There are uh, many governmental positions uh, that work on a variety of issues. So do you want to work on housing? Do you want to work on nutritional assistance? Do you want to work as an analyst and you're really interested in data and just computing numbers and that's what you love to do. Find out what really interests you and there's almost certainly a position out there that is exactly what you're thinking. And if there isn't, you can always make your own nonprofit organization, your own non-governmental organization because if there is a gap out there in services or in uh, public service, then you always have the opportunity to create that position which is pretty amazing. The second step, I would contact the relevant groups. So if you're interested in housing and you're in the mid Willamette Valley, it makes sense to talk to Habitat for Humanity, who are providing housing uh, for people who meet the requirements of their program. If you are interested, for example, in uh, veteran services, maybe you're a veteran, maybe you have uh, members of your family who are veterans, there are amazing programs in this community, in the Salem Kaiser community and the mid Willamette Valley for providing services to veterans who served uh, this country in uniform. And so there are groups out there for anything that you can think of. And so contacting those groups and asking about what kind of opportunities there are to get involved is really important. The, uh, the third, um, third thing that I would su suggest to you is developing the necessary skills, which to a certain extent you're already doing. You're here at Western Oregon University, you are learning uh, and you're developing your skills so that you can go into the workplace and be prepared. But there are other things that you can be doing. And sometimes this is going to be a volunteer opportunity. Sometimes this is going to be an internship. Sometimes this will be a fellowship. These will be programs or opportunities either after your time here at Western Oregon University or to supplement and to uh, kind of add to that experience while you're a student, is finding those opportunities, building these skills, so that when you're entering into public service, you can point to these positions, these responsibilities, and these skills that you have built that make you a good candidate for the job. And uh, that kind of leads us to the fourth one. Through this entire process, while you're trying to build your skills, when you're trying to do your research, when you're trying to uh, develop the contacts, uh, in these different industries or these different fields, get involved. Do something you know, this week, this month, this year to help prepare you, to get you into the community of people who are providing services, uh, either through a nonprofit organization, non-governmental organization, through the government. Find a way to get involved. There are a number of opportunities uh, in your community and in the surrounding areas if you're a commuter as well. And so even if these are volunteer uh, positions or volunteer work where you're not being paid. It's a way to get your foot in the door. It's your way to meet people and network, and that often leads to other positions. I can tell you that in the office next to mine, an intern who is a graduate from Western Oregon University and was interning in that office while she was a student now has a paid position in that office, and that's not uncommon. It's not uncommon that when an office or an organization is looking to hire someone, they think, well, who has already put time into this organization? Who do we know? and uh, what kind of work ethic, you know, what kind of work product did they contribute to. If you go and you have an internship, you have a volunteer opportunity, and you work hard, your supervisors will remember that. And it can be the best way to get that paid position and to enter public service in a way that you're being gainfully employed. Next up, what are some opportunities for recent graduates uh, to get involved 
and to enter public service. So some of them we mentioned before, you can volunteer with a nonprofit, you can volunteer with a non-governmental organization, you can also volunteer with a government organization, with a legislator, uh, with a member of the executive branch, uh, or with various programs of the, the different departments in Oregon, for example. Uh, Another one you can do is to pursue government service. There are a lot of programs for recent graduates like AmeriCorps, like the Peace Corps, where not only are you getting uh, some skills and some training, you're also getting work experience. And so you kind of get uh, both at the same time. And uh, uh, kind of a plug for myself, one of the things that I wish I would have done directly after leaving Western, and uh, of course I don't regret going into graduate studies, I had an incredible experience, but part of me wishes I would have done the Peace Corps because this is a two-year opportunity. You get to work on a specific project in a specific community, and it's kind of that gaining skills while gaining uh, work experience. And it's a really great way uh, to go from a graduate of a four-year degree and then have this experience, and you'll be very attractive when you're entering the job force, especially if you're looking at some sort of government service. The only downside is you can't be in the CIA. So if you're into the CIA, then don't, uh, don't go and do the Peace Corps. Uh, a third one, and this might shock you, run for public office. There are a number of positions at the local level. Uh, I know that oftentimes when we talk about running for office, we're thinking about the, the big offices. We're thinking about president, senate, house of representatives. But here, even locally in Monmouth, uh, I'll give you a, a very important example. So how many people ran for the mayor of Monmouth in 2016? See, Bell? One. One person ran to be the mayor of Monmouth in 2016. That means he had absolutely no opposition. He got the job just because he put his name on the ballot. Now, what happens if more people run? My opinion is we get a better uh, mayor out of it because we have choices and we can have dialogue about who's the better candidate. And so even as a student, if you're a resident of Monmouth, look at city council, look at fire district, look at soil and water conservation districts, and uh, look at the different opportunities that are available here. And I, and I say this, and I say it in all seriousness, there are opportunities to run for office, even if you're young, even if you're a student. And uh, these are opportunities that I think that more students should take advantage of because as we're moving forward, our generation right now, the millennial generation, I know that some of you aren't millennials, but we'll pretend that everyone here is a millennial. This is the single uh, most uh, populist uh, generation alive right now. And I was shocked to learn that, that there are more millennials than any other generation. And so if we are the generation that represents the majority of the country, why aren't we in positions of leadership? And so consider that. Discussion. I'm curious to hear what you all think. Does public service appeal to you? Is this something that's interesting? Is this something that you've considered or maybe as part of this presentation you've considered that might be right for you? And uh, why or why not? And remember, we are on camera. We are being recorded. But use that as an encouragement. Don't use that as a warning. Because again, the people who are going to be watching this presentation will not have opportunities to ask questions or add to the discussion. And your question, your point might be exactly what they're thinking. And so it's important to get out there. I do want to get into public service. Um, but I was wondering, how did you finance the University of Edinburgh? So we have a question from Will in the back. He is very much interested in public service. Good, Will. That, that means that I've, uh, I've done something good today. I have at least one person who's considering it. Uh, so the University of Edinburgh, uh, university in Scotland, uh, how did I finance it? Uh, well, the uh, federal government and their infinite practicality uh, understood that if they finance me to go to the University of Edinburgh, I'm going to give them that money back probably with interest and they don't have to provide me with anything. And so you can actually get federal funding from the federal government of the United States to go to a university in another country and uh, get an education, which is pretty incredible. And so if you are interested in going to a university in another country, if like myself, you come from a working class background where having you know, funding from your family was not really a legitimate option, there are still opportunities for you. Although taking out loans isn't necessarily the best option, but it'll get you there. Any other questions, discussion? Uh, someone that is a college student and has a busy schedule, mm -hmm. what would be some examples of public service that isn't that much of a time a commitment for like right now? Absolutely. So 
Uh, I can give you an example of something I'm currently working on. Uh, I'm a decently busy, uh, oh sorry, uh, thank you Dr. Pettinger uh, for cueing me in because TJ does not have a microphone. His question is for a student who has a busy schedule, which I, I know you all do because I was once a student myself, uh, what are some opportunities that have an appropriate time commitment so that you can balance work and studies and class along with the opportunities of public service? Uh, one example for myself, I'm currently a member of one of the commissions in Salem where I live. I'm on the Commission for Human Rights. We have one meeting a month. Uh, for about two hours. And so that's an uh, opportunity where you can connect with your community, talk about, in, in this case, this is a commission that's considering uh, bias crimes and uh, uh, things of that nature, and seeing what are ways that we can find a positive way to resolve the issue. If there are issues of bias, uh, racism, prejudice, how, how can we come to a resolution where everyone uh, feels better about what has happened. And so two hours, once a month. That's one example. Another example is, uh, for example, something like Habitat for Humanity. You can go out on a Saturday for four hours and swing a hammer and work on a house, a house that someone either doesn't have the amount of money to put a down payment for, uh, doesn't necessarily have perfect credit, but has enough of a stable income and has good enough credit that they can get into a home without the burden of having a down payment. And so that's something that when you can, you can go. There are a lot of different uh, organizations that are happy to have volunteers, even infrequently. And so I know that the challenge sometimes as a student is how do I balance everything? How can I balance school? How can I balance work? Can I have fun sometimes? You know, is there some time for recreational activities? But I also want to do something in my community, and that's, that's a really great question. There are opportunities out there to volunteer and Believe me, as someone who has benefited from the work of volunteers and calling people on the phone, begging them to come in and help out even for a few hours, uh, a few hours makes a big difference. And the difference between showing up and not showing up is huge. Great question. Any other questions, discussion? Why is it that if you join the Peace Corps, you can't join the CIA? If you know? uh, so Holt? Yeah. Okay, so Holt's question is, why, if you join the Peace Corps, can you not later jo join the CIA? So I'm not sure how much everyone knows about the Peace Corps. I'll try to be as concise as possible. The Peace Corps is an organization uh, funded by the federal government that sends American citizens into countries abroad for specific development projects, whether they be for economic development, <laughs> businesses, uh, water resources, making sure that um, agricultural groups and farmers have water to ha uh, get crops, to feed their family and feed their community. Now, there was some controversy with some of the first uh, graduates of the Peace Corps program that went on later to work in the federal government in intelligence, CIA, FBI, that kind of thing. And that damaged the legitimacy of these volunteers that are going into these countries. And so consider for a moment that the United States foreign policy sometimes is less than perfect. And consider sometimes that the United States has done questionable things in other countries. And so if you are a country, especially let's say in the Latin world, that has been on the has been negatively impacted by American foreign policy, why would you trust American citizens coming into your community? and living for a few years to work on projects. And part of uh, increasing the legitimacy of this program and part of making it so that there are less worries that uh, you know, a volunteer today, a spy tomorrow, essentially, is that they exclude people who are uh, Peace Corps volunteers from becoming agents or employees of the CIA. Uh, I saw a question, Jeremy. Oh, no, it's actually going to be in kind of what you're asking for, like, all, uh, opportunities to volunteer. Um, so I'm the vice president of Student Veterans of America, a chapter mm -hmm. here. It's a national organization, but ours is just a chapter of that national organization. We actually do a lot of uh, volunteering throughout our community. It's not a public organization, but mm -hmm. it's a kind of, we work, I mean, we've worked with uh, Paul Evans, mm -hmm. you know, Representative Evans, and Eric Case, and all that, and, you know, they, they kind of come into our office sometimes figuring out, like, what we can do to you know, better the community of veterans, and not just veterans, but their dependents um, that are utilizing GI benefits and stuff like that. So we've worked with uh, a organization called uh, Team Rubicon, which kind of works with Habitat for Humanity, making homes. Mm -hmm. It's generally for, uh, it's kind of veteran-centric, but it's still giving back, volunteering, and kind of giving out to your community. Absolutely. So, yeah, we offer that kind of stuff too, so if you want to room 108 in the uh, book.
Definitely. So, so Jeremy's talking specifically about uh, organizations, and sometimes not even public organizations, but groups that are supporting specific people in society, in this case, veterans. And so, and uh, also mentioned some of the work that Representative Evans is working on. I know that Habitat for Humanity now does at least one build specifically for a veteran and their family per year. And so there are opportunities if uh, helping and working with other veterans, or even if you're not a veteran yourself, but you want to support uh, veterans in your community, there are some really great opportunities. I can tell you that there is a liaison uh, through the administration here at Western Oregon University who works specifically with veterans on veteran issues. And so if that's something that you're really interested in, I know that both there's a liaison here on campus, but there is also your state representative if you live in the Monmouth Independence area is a veteran himself and works a lot in veterans issues. And so if you want to contact him. And an alumni. And he is an alumni. He's a former student and a former teacher here. And a president. And a student president. Uh, Steve. I was also going to mention, you can also get involved with uh, whatever political party that you identify with, because almost all of them do some kind of public service during the year, as well as um, there's a, a Republican um, um, club here on campus, as well as the Democrat club, which is starting up in the next couple of weeks. Both of those do some kind of volunteer work as part of their, uh, part of their you know, thing they do. So, I mean, if you, if you look into that, you can also get involved at a small level without having to go and, and try to figure out what it is you can do by yourself. Absolutely. And so what uh, Steve was talking about here is if you're interested in more of a partisan bent, if you're looking at uh, service to a political party or uh, ideology of some sort, uh, there are college groups here on campus, but there are also candidates running at every level of government in Oregon. And if you want to support uh, a candidate for one party or the other, there are opportunities um, to get involved with those campaigns. Absolutely. Do you know of uh, any research or uh, think tanks that you guys here at the local level are most frequently interfacing with? And if so, like, how one goes about working for them? Okay, so Will has a question about um, organizations uh, or nonprofits, think tanks that are working directly with local government and how to get connected with them. I can tell you that um, there is a public resource available to anyone at all. There is something called the Salem Capital Club. And if you go on Salem Capital Club, Google that, and you can find both clients and representatives of different organizations. And these vary from business groups to veterans uh, advocates to public sector unions, private sector unions, Planned Parenthood, NARAL Pro-Choice. There are a lot of different organizations that interface on a normal basis with our state representatives, senators, and executive members here in Oregon. And so if uh, any of those groups uh, sound interesting, you should check out the Salem Capital Club. There are a wealth of groups on there for pretty much anything you can think of advocating for people with disabilities, advocating for students, the Oregon Student Association, or, uh, even advocating for nurses. If you're a nurse, then there's an adv there are two, actually, adv advocacy groups for you. And so there are a lot of opportunities. As far as think tanks and uh, more of the MPO route, uh, I know that our office has a good contact with the Oregon Center for Public Policy, which is used to be based out of Silverton and Marion County and now is based out of Portland. And so if research and statistics uh, kind of are what you're into, uh, I think the Oregon Center for Public Policy is a great organization. And I want to be mindful of time. Uh, we have about five minutes left. Uh, so I will give the option to, to you who are here. I have a short video, two minutes, which would take up about half of what we have left. Uh, and I can talk about something specific that my office is working on, or we can continue to kind of have this conversation. I can answer some questions and we can take some remarks. So I'm going to leave it completely up to you. Uh, we've, we've got a nice thing going here, I think. Uh, some, some really interesting questions, some interesting remarks. And so I'd be happy to continue uh, this part of the presentation. But if you'd like to move on and learn a little bit about what my office is working on and why, then I'd be happy to do that as well. My name is Mohammed. Uh, so you continue your master's degree on your, what was your master about? Okay, so we have a question from Mohammed in the front row talking about um, specifically my experience having studied for a master's degree in, at the University of Edinburgh. I studied uh, in a program called International Political Theory. Uh, which was interesting for me because I have always been interested in international relations. I think I took the majority of the classes that Dr. Pettinger offered uh, because I thought they were so interesting. And especially coming from a small town perspective, learning about the world was very, very interesting for me personally. And so with this program, what I really liked about it is it went beyond, you know, sort of the history of, you know, the, this is what has happened, this is why we're organized in the way that we are, to 
how should we be organized? And looking at normative theory, looking at why, why do we do the things that we do, and we're looking at the context of um, states interacting with other states, uh, looking at questions of war and morality, looking at questions of immigration, looking at uh, questions of international aid. And so going from the this, is the, this is the reality on the ground right now around the world to this is how it could be or it should be, based on your perspective was really interesting for me uh, to, to study and really delve deep into there. And so I absolutely recommend the program and absolutely recommend the University of Edinburgh if that's something you're interested in. You keep talking about you know, searching out things. I, I was lucky enough for the past three years I've been working with a nonprofit doing research work. Uh, I just recently graduated with an associate's degree and then transferred here. Mm -hmm. So with an associate's degree, I was doing research work with people with master's degrees and PhDs. That came about because I had a professor and now a good friend and mentor who was involved in that same group. Mm -hmm. So who had ties? And Absolutely. So that's how I got involved with that. So seek out what your professors used to do or are currently still doing, and that's another avenue. Absolutely. Because now I'm set. You know, I, I've been working for him for three years, and I pretty much have a standing invitation. That's great. So, so uh, for folks who didn't hear Mike, he's talking about how, uh, as a student who graduated with an associate's degree, he's now working um, on his bachelor's degree here at Western Oregon University. He was able to get into a nonprofit organization where he's providing research, <clears throat> working alongside folks with bachelor's degrees, working alongside folks with master's degrees. And so when we're talking about networking, when we're talking about volunteering, when we're talking about contacting groups to see what they're doing, what the opportunities are, there are legitimate opportunities that can get your foot in the door, uh, maybe without the qualifications that you think that you would need. And so again, that's why it's so important to reach out and to see what are the opportunities available in organizations in your community, because even if you don't think that you're qualified, you might be wrong. And you might fit that position, you might fit that organization so well that even though you haven't necessarily finished your, uh, your degree, whether that be a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, uh, going into a doctorate program, uh, you might be able to still get some great work with that organization. Uh, that said, I encourage you all to finish your programs. <laughs> independent of what kind of jobs you're working on. Uh, we have a couple minutes left. Uh, this is great. Uh, so we've heard uh, a lot of, from the fellows and, and the audience. Can we, can we kind of balance that uh, from some of the uh, female students in the audience? Anyone have question, comment? Okay, here we go. So Haley. Okay, yeah. Uh, so you talked about how you serve on like a local commission mm -hmm. in the Salem Kaiser area. How do you go about finding out about those and how, when they meet and what they're talking about? Absolutely. So for, for this in particular, Salem, the city of Salem has a website and as public uh, meeting law, we have laws in Oregon about when a public institute or a public organization meets, they have to make that readily available to the public. And so the time, the place, and the topics to be discussed are all publicly available online. Uh, I'm not as familiar with Monmouth's uh, website, but there um, are almost certainly opportunities if you go onto the city of Monmouth's website to look at what commissions are there, what citizen task force, what budget committees uh, that are available that you could apply for and uh, to, uh, to be a part of. And I'll, I'll tell you this, so I applied to this commission I sent in my application, they had an opening, and I didn't hear anything back. And so I showed up to the meeting anyways, because I had applied, I was interested, and I talked to the administrator of the program, and uh, she said, yeah, we're, we're backlogged, we haven't done a good job about uh, making sure that we're getting to applications. But the fact that I was there, she said, you know, we're, we have a spot coming up, and we would like you to, to take that spot. And so even though I hadn't gone through the entire uh, application process, I was invited to join the commission because I showed up because I was interested and uh, took the initiative to be there. And so honestly, showing up, being there is huge. And the difference between showing up and not is huge. If you wanna get your foot in the door, if you want to make connections, if you want to serve. And so absolutely there are opportunities that I, I hope are available on uh, the Monmouth uh, City website. Uh, if not there, then I would contact uh, either your state representative, uh, if you live in Monmouth Independence, be Representative Evans, or your city councilor. Uh, they should show you by ward who your councilor is, and you can email them and say, hey, what are the opportunities? I want to get involved. Great question. So the question again from Haley being, uh, how can I get involved? Where is this information if I want to join something locally? And uh, there are opportunities that you can find on, 
on Monmouth City uh, website or through contacting your local representative, either that be a state legislator or a uh, city councilor. One last question, one last comment, discussion? Well, uh, we are very fortunate to have someone in the room ha who has spent a great deal of her professional career as a public servant, so maybe she can tell us what she thinks. Uh, Dr. Pettinger, would you be willing to talk about your own experience as a public servant and what you've learned and what advice you can give to these uh, wonderful students? You know, you're thinking about veterans being public servants Absolutely. and thinking about who's serving and so forth. So um, for myself, um, I, you know, thinking about being a teacher to me is a big part of public service and providing service, for, particularly working for a public university. Um, but I also thinking about things that I've done through my life. So I've always have volunteered for different organizations, causes that matter to me. And I really have gone on, you know, looking on a website, calling people, tracking down and just saying I want to do something and being persistent. So that to me, and that's part of this class that you're taking as well, is forcing you to go out and be participating. But it really is. There are a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of people that want to work with you, that are looking desperate for people to come in and help. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's interesting if you just keep asking questions and looking and wherever you go, if it's a religious organization, it, if it's the local dog park, if it is, you know, whatever uh, social issue is of concern to you, there's a lot of places out there that you, if you're thinking about the things you care about or the things that you do in your day-to-day -day life, there are places to go and ask and see how can you help Absolutely. answer your question. Absolutely. That okay. was a very, very good answer. Now, uh, we've gone a little bit over time, and I want to be respectful of both your time and Dr. Pettinger's. Uh, and so I'll leave you with this. Uh, echoing the sentiments of Dr. Pettinger, there are opportunities. Um, there are people who would love to be uh, connected with you, to work with you on uh, different public service projects. And if you are interested in getting involved, I have a very small stack of my business cards here. It has my mobile number as well as my work email. If this is something that you're really interested in, I would be more than happy to help you find an organization in your community that uh, fits both your values, your vision, and what you want to accomplish in your community. And I'll, I'll make myself available to that uh, to that. Uh, end to, to help you find something if this is something that you're really interested in. I can't promise you that you'll get every opportunity because I can't even promise that for myself, uh, but I can say that the more that you try and the more effort that you put into this, the more that you'll get out, the more opportunities that you'll find, and the better off the community will be for you having stepped up when uh, other people step aside. All right, so I'm just going to say thank you very much. Thank you.